Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And this is going to be a special podcast where the slow talkers, Russ Morgan, Joey Murray, and we added, of course, the brilliant Sharon Srivatsa from the Business School podcast. And Sharon is now president of Real, a public company. And he's, uh, I put on my anchorman voice. He's a big deal. Not that Russ and Joey aren't a big deal because they are a huge deal. Uh, but the the four of us were in Scrub Island uh, a few months back in the British Virgin Islands. And if you've never been to the British Virgin Islands, it was absolutely beautiful. But we were there with our Passive Income Mastermind group. And after the uh, mastermind, we wanted to bring out what our biggest takeaways were from that uh, that week and what we learned and, and share it with all of you so that you didn't have to go through the uh, arduous journey of getting to Scrub Island and still get the, the knowledge that uh, we all learned in the, uh, the meeting. So without further ado, please enjoy this podcast with Russ, Joey, Sharon, and myself. All right, guys, we're going to cover the secrets that investors won't tell you, which is really important when you're trying to find ways to become a better investor, right? There's no good or bad investment. It's only good or bad investors. And today, the four of us are going to break down what those secrets are, uh, what that means for you as an everyday investor, how to partner with people on deals to make you a better investor, and maybe just a few examples of things we've done. Let me bring in our first guest, Mr. Sharon Shravatsa, my man, Sharon, how do you think about this topic today? You know, I, uh, Russ, I think this is super relevant today more than any other time because of the social media revolution and everyone is a proposed guru out there. And the the one thing that I would offer to people is influencers are not financial advisors. And, and in fact, most influencers speak in 30 to 90 second blips uh, after researching a piece of topic and a piece of content, but anything past that, most of them don't have the depth of knowledge around it. And now it's not good or bad. They're doing it to get views. They're trying to build an audience, but that influences a lot of people. And because of that, we think that uh, any investment is easily accessible. Any investment like making an algorithmic trade by buying AI that'll just buy your stocks for you on Robinhood or making some random investment because someone else made you do that. The stuff that is mass market is arbitraged out. You're going to get mass market results with mass market investment. If you want an easy button, an easy button on anything is not going to get you transformational results. So I think that I want to caution people and I want to caution myself and all of us here is that if there is an easy button on this, somebody else needs to kind of work through the idea. My partner, Robert, always says, it can, if it's passive for somebody, it needs to be active for someone else. So just because it's passive investment for you, someone has to go do the work to create value. And so um, I think the biggest secret a lot of investors miss and the best investors know is that finding the right deal flow is not the mass market ones finding the right deal flow that creates big results are you got to dig a little. Wow, love that. Let's bring in the lane geek himself, Mark Podolsky. Mark, what's your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I love what Sharon said. And I absolutely agree. I, I think, you know, nobody wins a race they don't want to be in. So you have to really, before you even analyze a deal like i've I, you know through the past i'm sure we're going to talk about some case studies i remember investing in a deal because i got all excited about my friend's excitement about the deal and it's going to get a five to ten extra turn and it's going to do this and that and never did i actually think how does this is this a, a race i even want to be in like do i why do i want this appreciation at this time in my life, do I want appreciation? Do I want cash flow? Do I want tax benefits? Like, I never even assessed it. What What's the race I want to win? And I think that's one of the secrets that the, the best investors know. They know immediately going in, is this even a, a race I want to be in? Mm. Yeah, too often times we get that FOMO. And it puts us in a situation that then we spend sleepless nights wondering why we made those decisions, right? It's so good. All right. The Italian Stallion's in the house. Mr. Joe Amire. Stallion, what's your thoughts on this topic? My brother, glad to be here. I, I would say that uh, the biggest lesson 
is educate before you invest. Education is your greatest investment. And the reason I say that is our world is kind of predicated, the investment world in particular is predicated on people that have the knowledge putting together investments for everybody else, right? And so if you're not willing to put the time and energy and effort into educating yourself, you are always going to get the leftovers. You're never going to be on the front end of a deal. You're never going to be able to really understand what you're investing in. And that puts you in a very vulnerable spot, right? And, and so the, the importance of that, and we see this every day when we're in our Passive Income Mastermind together, you guys are all in there. We're seeing it be- like investors becoming better investors right before our eyes. Right on our due diligence panel we did yesterday within our group, people were learning what are the questions to ask when I'm looking at a potential deal, and how many how many like light bulbs were going off where people were like, oh, what a great idea. They're simple, but if you've never been trained, you've never actually taken the time and money to invest in your own education, you're always going to get the leftovers. You're never going to get the kind of returns that you really want. And you're going to be subject to someone else's um, education that's come before you. Well, and here's a good point to that is that you don't need 10,000 hours in this subject matter to become the expert, right? Because really you can do some due diligence. You can read a couple of books. You can like have a couple of different operators break down the deal for you and you'll know more than 99% of the people out there. And you can start to determine whether you need to make Edu- you know, make the decision because you have more education it doesn't require, you know, a four year master's degree, right? I think that that's the problem. Most people believe, oh, well, that's the reason I have to use someone else because I'm not qualified. And here's another secret that I don't think that everyone knows is investors. Everyone makes money, but everyone loses money too. And nobody wants to tell you that. Nobody wants to tell you about all the deals that they lost. But yet in this room, we've had this conversation multiple times, especially within our mastermind, about those deals that have not gone the way that we wish they would have and the lessons that we learn and how we are better investors. Because here's the thing. If you lose money and you quit, your option is to go backwards to right where you were before. And if you remember when you were in that position, unhappy with the job, unhappy with the lifestyle, unhappy with the fact that you weren't able to spend time with your family at the level that you wanted to, that's what you're going back to. So quitting means going back to that, continuing on. Yeah, it takes courage. It takes having to do it again, being willing to lose money again. But as you continue to grow in this, you'll be making better decisions and you'll far exceed the expectations that you would have ever had in that former life. All right, let's talk about what this means for the everyday investors, Ron. So um, I'll give you an example that uh, Joey's not going to love. Right. And the example is that when I was a young kid, my dad wanted to teach me about the stock market. And the interesting part, well, he was being a good dad. He was teaching me how to invest. And we didn't have enough money for my dad to say, hey, Sharon, here's $10,000. Go put it in whatever you want. He taught me something. He's like, hey, Yahoo has a mock portfolio. I want you to manage a $10,000 mock portfolio. I want you to actually make the bets. I want you to actually see how it changes, how it trades. And my father and I would actually look at this on a weekly basis, which I thought was super powerful. That was my way of connecting with him. But I saw things move. I saw things go up and down. I saw things simulate. What did the best fighter pilots do? They spend 95% of their time in simulators so that when they're actually in, in the air, do in the cockpit, they feel like they've had the reps. They feel like their muscle memory kicks in. And I think the big part that that happens is that we forget that investing is a full contact sport. We can't just be intellectual investors. We got to do more than that. So my my first thing that I would say is what it means for most people is that the average person is like, well, Sean, I don't have $100,000 to invest. I'm like, you don't need it. But the sooner you can get investor reps, the better. Even you make a $5,000 investment in something, you start to realize, oh, I spent the five grand. I know what happened. I lost it. I made more money with it. You get to understand so much. If you make the money, you realize, wow, I got leverage. If you lose the money, you realize, wow, I learned from this. So 
I want to, what it means for most people is the sooner we can get in the game, the sooner you can have your mock portfolio become the full contact sport, I think the better. And it doesn't have to be the big chunk right away. And I think we learn to put more at play. And I, I'll give you the sec- my second piece of this is, I think investing is one thing that is so personal that I would offer as a piece of advice, never feel peer pressure to doing it. I think we just need a piece of language that says, if if a friend offered you a deal, I think the piece of language around it is, hey, this this doesn't fit our family's investment goals. You can just say that. What are they going to say after that? Nothing. So if if it doesn't feel, the reason why most people feel compelled or feel peer pressure to do something is because they don't have a linguistic response to say no without offending the other person. If Russ offered me a deal and I didn't want to do it, I didn't feel comfortable about it. You can give a very generic, vague answer saying, hey, this doesn't feel in line with our family's investment goals. What is Russ going to say? He's going to respect that. The reason why most people get peer pressured is because they don't have the language to say no thoughtfully, caringly. And and you should also invite the opening for the future. Hey, Russ, this doesn't feel like it's in alignment with our future goals. But if if it's okay with you, I'd love to do something else with you in the future. Would you keep me in mind for future opportunities? That feels really good without feeling pressured around it. So I would offer that don't feel like you need to do every deal to get the next deal, but be honest when you say it doesn't feel in alignment. Well, and as I come to you, Joey, next, I think what you're saying there, and I've heard you say this before, Joey, that a lot of times you feel the pressure to do the deals that are brought to you because you don't have enough deals, right? And so you're hearing one deal. And so it's either amazing or horrible. And like you said, Mark, if someone else's excitement is a lot of times what dictates our excitement. But if we have hundreds of deals, if we're always looking at deals, it's we know we can't say yes to all of them. So it creates a mentality that I have to be a better discerner of information and I don't get all excited about the one deal. So, I, Joey, I know you yeah. want to add to this. What, what do you think this how this point plays to the everyday investor? Well, here's, I'm a really simple guy. And so I hear the topic of these are secrets that investors won't tell you. And the real basic understanding that has to take place is if you don't think of yourself as an investor, then that's why you don't know the secrets. But that's part of the reason, right? So the first thing is a mindset, right? I need to become an investor. I need to think of myself as not advocating that to somebody else. Oh, well, they're, they're more, you know, they, they do more real estate deals. They understand this. So they're the investor. I'm just somebody that could invest with them. No, no, no. You're an investor. And if you can change that little, like that little thing in your brain that says, I'm an investor, you start to see these things a lot more. They're not, no longer secrets. The second thing about that is they're only secrets if you're not in the right rooms, right? If you are not in and among other investors who are farther along than you, then that's why they're secrets. But in those rooms, they're not. They're readily available. In fact, in places like our Passive Income Mastermind, which by the way, it doesn't have to be our mastermind. It could be anything. But you need to give yourself the opportunity to be behind those scenes so that these are no longer secrets, that you can actually take action on these things and you can become the person that knows, that kind of sees what's going on. One of our, our mentors, Nelson Nash, um, you know, the founder of the Infinite Banking Concept, the guy that really dramatically changed Russ and I, your, you know, our lives in terms of this whole topic of investing. He says, when you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. Mm. And that is more clear and more true about this topic than anything else. When you see what's going on in the investment world, you know exactly then what to do. If you want to have one one comment on this one, I think that uh, um, my coach told me this. She's just super powerful. She said, you want to be around people where your aspiration is their current reality. Right. And, and, that is soup. Like if you want to be an investor and if you are with investors, they will talk like the, that is what their current reality is. We all talk about our current reality all the time. We all say that, Hey, I went golfing this weekend. That is my current reality. But for those that is, that is their aspiration. Current reality becomes normal conversation. And as Joey said, it's not secrets anymore. So if there is a way for, for you, me, us to be in more, in more fellowship with people who, where our aspiration is their current reality, I think that's the fastest way to level up. 
as you're listening to this, if you don't have a group of people who are challenging you, where your aspirations are greater than anybody around you and you have nobody to challenge you to a higher level, I'm going to call you to action right now. Go to the passive income mastermind.com and take advantage of the opportunity to apply to be a part of this group and to sit in rooms with Mark Podolsky, with Sharon Shavas and Joe Murray, and many, many more people with thousands of deals of experience that help you level up each and every day. All right, Mark. So first point was, how does this apply to the everyday investor? I want to come to you now. How though do we partner with people? So, you know, partnering with people used to be really complicated, right? But today with technology, there's, there's an easy button. There's a really simple tool and it's called TribeVest. And they literally do everything for you. But to get back to, to Joey's point, what's the mindset? And I know you guys are going to roll your eyes when I steal your cliche. But if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But if you want to go fast and far, go with kindred spirits. And there's nothing better than partnering with kindred spirits on a deal and everyone can win together. And, you know, we're all in mastermind groups. When the collective intelligence of a group, it far exceeds one person because we all are coming from different experiences. We've all lost money. We've all made money. We say, oh yeah, this is this reminds me of a time when. Here's a red flag. Oh yeah, this reminds me of a time when I made a ton of money. And, and it, it's just, this is this works. So that is why you should partner with other people. And certainly use a simple tool. Use TribeVest. It makes it easy. I, I, lo I love TribeVest. And one of the things too, I'll add to this point, and I want to move on to some examples because I know everybody learns through stories and examples, especially the things that we've done, right? The, the one way to help you become financially free is listening to other people who've already done that. And then you can use those examples, use that inspiration but the key to partnering with people is also finding out what your strengths are, what your area of genius is, and also understanding where your areas of weakness are. And Sharon has a great saying, don't work on your weaknesses. All you're going to do is have strong weaknesses, right? You need to find partners who have strengths in areas that you don't. So when you find partners, look for people who possess things that you don't possess. There's many, many tools out there that can do that, whether it's DISC, Colby, Culture Index. Find some sort of tool that can help you analyze the people that you need to be partnered with because you know who you are and you know where your areas of strengths are, but the areas that you need to upgrade in. All right, Sharon, let's talk about some examples of things we've done so we can help people understand how they can have the secrets that have been in our minds so that they can use those to gain more financial freedom for themselves. Yeah, I'll give you a, a, a big mindset shift that happened for me. I thought investing was a was a solo game because money's personal and I had to figure out how to invest. I had to figure out where to go. I had to figure out, oh, do I actually, if I talk to this person, I have to make it all hypothetical. I had to say, hey, Mark, just assume I was going to invest maybe like $10 into this. What would you do? So I have to concoct these random scenarios to get advice. And I think that's the number one problem is when you have to do hypotheticals with people that can't actually help you. And so the big shift that one of my, my, one of my partners today has been my partner for 20 years told me was, if you raise a shrine, if you realize that investing in groups is the only way you invest, and that is the only choice you make, making money with groups, making money with friends is way more joyful than making money any other time. And, and that was a big shift for me. So I have not made that. I got the early education early on where I'd had to cut down a couple of deals and I, you know, I'd done, I bought my first real estate property without anybody's help and I could have done it so much better. I did, I got the down payment off my credit cards and I actually did that myself. So I got into a property, I got $20,000 in a credit card advance. I got a loan on the rest and no, looking back, I would not have done that at all because I net net, I made no money. Net net, it was super stressful. Net net, I had nobody else to talk to about it because when we, put our personal lives on the line, our personal savings on the line, our personal investments on the line. And you don't have somebody in the game with you to talk through it with you, to talk about the highs to, uh, or to celebrate the highs and to talk through the lows. It's very difficult. I'll give you one example. This is super important. Sometimes deals go bad. 
And when they go bad, you have nobody to talk through with, what do we do next? And one of the deals that, that me and my partner invested in recently went sideways. And I would tell you that it would have taken me a long time to get over it, but just having him to talk through what to do next was helpful. And then he had an attorney. He's like, hey, I have an attorney who's a friend who will actually consult with us on this. And then we got we were able to get on a call doing that. And I was like, hey, I have a friend who has who's an analyst who has a model that can run this. And we were able to pull that together. If I had to do that all myself, I would have been so scared, so nervous, and would not sleep well at night. So a big lesson for me is I made a decision early on after I got this piece of advice that I don't make any investments myself. I'm always investing in groups only. I only invest in groups because making money with other people is way more joyful because then if the four of us invested in something and let's say we made money around it, the next time one of us gets a deal, we're like, hey, I want Sharon in on this deal. So we get to see more opportunities because we invest together. And if something goes awry, we have a great story. We have a joint learning. We have a joint camaraderie around it as well. So either situation is pretty powerful. So um, my big learning on this was I just made a baseline decision that I'm only investing with other people with groups because investing in groups is so much more joyful and has a nice protective baseline around it. Yeah, I love that. Mark, how about an example, something that you've done that would be helpful to the person listening right now? So you guys know I'm a I'm an inch wide and a mile deep. That being said, uh, back in the day, uh, I remember, I think it was like 2005, I, I did a house flip. My first house flip, was, this is in Phoenix, the market's going crazy, and it was a I think it was a $400,000 home. And I remember, and I did it with a buddy. And this, in the camaraderie and the bonding of doing it with my buddy was like, it was great because we were so excited about it. We go into the house, we're meeting the general contractors. Now, would I ever do one again? No. Like when, when I factored in my time, I actually lost money on this deal. That's a <laughs> side note. Anyways, but it was, it was just kind of fun to do. And then we, we flipped it. And we, we doubled our money and we learned a lot of lessons. And for me, the biggest lesson I learned was this is really fun to do with a buddy. And, you know, Sharon mentioned, like, when you, if your passive income exceeds 200% of your fixed expenses, you don't want to be the only person on the golf course on a Monday at noon because all your friends are working, right? And so there's there's so much more benefits to doing things together and it's joyful, but uh, my example, so I'm using my example to kind of say, um, you know, there's there's more joy doing deals with with friends. And Russ, I don't know. I, I feel like I've got ADD. I didn't sleep well last night. Did I even answer that question correctly? Well, yeah. I mean, you told us about example. a deal. I mean, that's what we were looking for. Yeah. I mean, you've kept with the theme that you believe that it's important for us to do deals with other people, and also sometimes you need to account for your time because I think too often times, right, we don't account for the time it takes to do a deal, and sometimes we think, oh, well, that's the pathway to success. While you can make money, and there's nothing wrong with being active in investing to start making money, right? The concept that we have is the passive income mastermind. Our goal is to have two hundred percent of our expenses covered by passive income means that we can't spend it all. We're going to have to give it to someone else. Well, in order to do that, you have to scale. So eventually you have to figure out how to learn the thing so that you can then start teaching other people how to do the thing. And then you become the land geek where you just watch money come in daily from <laughs> flipping land and watching and managing other people who are doing it at a high level in something that's actually scalable. I love that. Stallion, what's your example that you'd like to share? Well, I mean, so far, I've heard each of you say there's more Joey uh, when we work together. Like, I, I love that. <laughs> I love being the center of everybody's uh, world when it comes to investing. So I appreciate you guys. No, I'm just kidding. But the, the thought I have about this is take personal inventory about your strengths, about your experiences and your resources. We talk about this a lot in the world, uh, well, that Wall Street world about your investor DNA. And starting with those things can be super, super powerful when you're talking about your investing journey. It doesn't mean that that's where you'll end up. And it doesn't mean that that's where you'll stay. And I'll give you my, my example. When I left the mortgage business, the very first investment that I made 
was in doing private mortgages for other people. I didn't go looking for it, by the way. It just found me. I had somebody call up and say, hey, uh, this is a realtor friend of mine. I've got this person. They don't really fit the mold as far as like a conventional mortgage. But um, I, I just thought of you and I thought, maybe do you know somebody that would be willing to do a private mortgage? And I kind of took in the situation and immediately I could underwrite the deal. I could say, wait a minute, tell me about the person, tell me about the property, the collateral, what kind of terms are they willing to do, all these things. I could immediately just, without even thinking, ask some very specific questions. And I was very much at peace making this investment because I had so many reps leading up to that point. Now, had I thought about doing private mortgages before that? No. It was because I had this large amount of cash sitting in my policies, my my own banking system, and I wasn't going to need that for any time in the near future. And so I had access to cash and I had this knowledge. I put those together and I made actually two private mortgages within a short amount of time. And those things were on autopilot. It was just simply money coming in every month. And I had no, I wasn't worried about it because I had so much previous experience. And so I would just say to you, as you're listening to this, what are those things that you have? What are those unique experiences, unique background that you know God has given you in your life that you can now apply to investing? And again, it may not be the home run. Right now, I'm not doing private mortgages because I started to realize that there's other things that I can do at a higher level, um, create more cash flow on a monthly basis that actually gives me more joy, joy or Joey, whatever you want to call it. And I'm grateful for that. So I've I've progressed as an investor, but start where you're at and use your experiences. And I think you'll go far. Stran, I know you're eager to get one more example in. So I'll let you know. I, I, I want to give some an example that I that I utilized early in my career. And I wish uh, I had known that sooner. So the fastest way for most people to think that they can make some quick cash is that they're like, man, it would be amazing if I did a real estate flip. And I will tell you right now, 99% of the folks should not do real estate flips because it's there's it, the components are so, there's so many diverse components to it. And, but if you think about it, uh, one, I mapped it out one day and I was like, wait a minute, there's literally, I think there's a lot of components, but there's actually only three. There is a money component as to how do I actually fund this deal? There is a Market component is like, how do I buy, sell, position this asset and get the market knowledge around it? And number three, how do I do the flip exactly? There's a contractor component around it. So I was like, okay, awesome. If I can go to a marketplace like Mount Shasta, California, where I can buy a property for $100,000, meaning I'm putting $20,000 down. If I am the investor, all I need is to get an agent to know the market and get a general contractor. The best teams, if you want to build a great partnership upfront and learn to ever do this, it's if you can find a cap, an investor, a real estate agent, and a general contractor, that's one of the best teams that you can always have one going. In fact, my partner right now always has at least one flip going and he's the investor. The real estate agent comes in, finds the, buys the property, sells the property, manages her commissions around it. And then she manages a general contractor. And at the end of the day, they put all their money in the one pot and they split it three ways. So it's super powerful where now you get, as Joey said, you get the true power of partnership where you know what exactly your skill are. So maybe you're a general contractor. Maybe you know a general contractor. Maybe you're a real estate agent and you're like, wait, how do I, instead of getting commissions, how do I get pieces of equity? Because that that agent made significantly more than her commissions because she made the buy side commission, sell side commission, and she made the equity component, which I think is super powerful because we would have needed that anyway. So uh, a big part of partnerships is also realizing there's like simple structures that you can practically have that you can do this. So if you're an investor right now, you're, you're thinking about being an investor, I guarantee you know a real estate agent in your marketplace. I would shoot them an email saying, hey, uh, if you see any deals that you want an uh, investor to partner with you on a flip, let me know. And you would be amazed at how many deals that that agent can send you. So every time, by the way, I hear you say Mount Shasta, it re- takes me back to like being six years old, going in my grandparents' refrigerator and trying try my best to swallow down a diet Shasta Cola. Like those <laughs> things are the most 
disgusting things on earth. <laughs> there's not there's nothing. I love Mount. There's nothing in Mount Shasta, California, except the except the Mount Shasta itself. There's a little <laughs> little sleepy town. You know, there's nothing there. So I, I know those are completely unrelated. Is my assumption. All right, here, I'm gonna give you one last thing as we start to wrap up here because we we've covered what does this mean for the everyday person? How do we partner with people? And you've seen lots of different examples because that's what we're talking about now. Examples of what we've done. I, I'm gonna share one that I think is underutilized, but there's so much opportunity. It kind of connects to what you were saying there, Joey. I remember in 2007, the market was crashing, right? I was a certified financial planner. Market's crashing everywhere. I was at the time an investment advisor. My uh, my father-in-law had a couple different stocks. We put some stop losses on them. And when the market started diving, those were activated. They were triggered, right? So those two big holdings that he had in Bank of America, uh, which is one of the, the major holdings, all those things were triggered and it all went to cash. And he and I were both completely terrified of what was happening. We had no idea. And we were sitting in cash and cash was, went immediately to earning 0. 0.00001, right? It was nothing. Had no idea. I read the book that you refer- referenced a second ago, the Becoming Your Own Banker book. And it was talking about what do banks do with money, right? They just take other people's deposits and then lend it out. December of 2008, my wife, Sharon, opens a dental practice, goes to Bank of America of all places and gets a $800,000 loan at 7.95%. She starts making like a $7,500 payment every single month. And I'm reading this book talking about how it takes people's families' deposits and turns around and loans it back out to them in the form of home loans, car loans, credit card loans, and business loans. And I thought, all I've got to do is cut the middleman out of this transaction. And now my wife doesn't need to send the money to Bank of America. She can direct the money directly to her family. I go to my father-in-law. I was like, how would you like to have $7,500 a month coming in for the next 15 years on this you know, $800,000? He said, that'd be amazing. That doesn't exist. I said, what if it would be guaranteed and you would love the person that was sending it to you? He goes, what are you talking about? I told him. He was like, this is fantastic. And we didn't make it the full 15 years because my wife sold the dental practice in 10. So we paid him off the end. But that one transaction opened up a world of investing for us. We started to realize that we needed to be in control of the cash, as you were just talking about, Joey. And then it started to open our eyes to how when we partner with each other. So now we started doing deals together. We started doing real estate deals, business deals, all sort of opportunities happen because of that one book idea. Well, there's a lot of secrets that we didn't get to today. And I'm going to reference it again. If you want to see how to take part in a mastermind and have these conversations on a monthly basis, go to thepassiveincomemastermind.com and apply. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if this is a good fit. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share this with everybody. And for you listening, uh, regardless to what podcast you're listening to this on, every one of us takes so much time and effort to put these together. We need to know from you. We need to hear from you. Is this something that you find value? And if you do, rate and review the show and share it with somebody else. Have an amazing day. I hope you were able to receive some really nice nuggets of wisdom from that podcast and the Scrub Island experience. And you're probably wondering, well, how can I go to that next event? Well, all you have to do is register for the next event. And it's accredited invest investors only. So if you're an accredited investor, that means you have a million dollar net worth, excluding your primary home, or you make over $250,000 a year in annual income. If you meet that criteria, go to www.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash www.s dash passive dash income dash mastermind. We will have a link to that application so you can apply and learn more. All right, let freedom ring. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.